now you get to listen to this beautiful voice talk to you for a while. Um, but I also want to thank Dad for his message because we talked about it yesterday over the phone some, and he was like, I think it might go into yours a little bit. It might feed into it well. And after hearing it in its whole, it definitely uh, does fit in, and I will uh, be calling back on it some probably throughout. Circle back. Uh, but if everybody would take their Bibles, and I got to lay some foundation um, before we actually get into our main text today, but take your Bibles and turn over to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And we'll start in verse 25. And I'll say, after hearing Dad's message, that I'm not worried about this, but maybe slightly concerned. <laughs> slightly concerned for us, for the church. Um, and let's just go ahead and start reading before I ramble on too much. But in verse 25, Jesus says, And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distresses distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken and they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory now when these things begin to take place straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near I know this is something that me and Heather have talked about often over the past year, probably. And I know Freddie did a message recently talking about this concept of looking up from where your redemption comes from. And while I read that passage, I can't say that we are in those times, but I believe it is safe to say that, and I hope, that we have found ourselves looking up from where our redemption comes from. But again, I have a slight concern, a worry, a fear for the church. Because again, we can read this passage and it can sound quite scary. But Jesus tells us simply, straighten up and look up from where your redemption comes from. Have faith. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first dwelling eternally in the presence of God the Father and his righteousness, which is found in only our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. So yes, I hope we are looking up from where our redemption comes from more and more. But what I do not want us to do is just stand there and look. Turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 6. It says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood, in, stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And again, brothers and sisters, I urge us all to look up from where our redemption comes from. But don't just stand there. We're not going to miss Jesus coming back. We are going to know. There will be no doubt in our mind. If we hear people say, look over here, there's Jesus. We know it's not true. 
because he is coming the way he went. Every eye will see. There will be no confusion when our Lord and Savior returns. But we have been told to go. We have been given a commission. Have we not? A great commission. And that is where our main text comes from. I want us to all turn over to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, and we'll start in verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which, they had, to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And here we have the Great Commission. And the first thing I want to make sure we all understand is that this Great Commission was not just given to the disciples, to the eleven. This was given to the church. To every single person sitting here today, this commission was given to you. And yes, that great commission will look different for each and every single one of us, but it is a commission that we have all been given by our very own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many theologians and scholars say that it was not just the 11 who was here when Jesus gave this commission. And I can't argue that, because again, this commission was not just given to them, it was given to the church. And at this point in time, we already have two stories of Christ. Go up to just verse 11. After the Marys had seen the empty tomb, and Jesus had told them to go and tell the eleven that he has risen, It says in verse 11, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled the elders, assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, We will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. And this is still true, again, to this day. That some just write off Jesus' resurrection as his disciples sneaking into the tomb and stealing his body out. Jews, atheists, plenty of people use this excuse. But here in this time, this day and age, we find ourselves with different stories of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's the Christ that's told whose body was just stolen out of the tomb. There's the Christ of the prosperity gospel. There's the Christ of Islam. Of Buddhism, of Hinduism, there is Christ of many different stories. There's the Christ who was born on December 25th. There's the Christ of Easter. And then there is the one true Christ, our Messiah, who is revealed in the scriptures, revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the Sabbath who spent three days and three nights in the tomb, who was resurrected by the very power of God. He is revealed in this scripture, and he is the one that we obey. He is the one that we proclaim. And this is why we see that some there, 
when Jesus gave this commission, doubted. Even seeing him before them, some doubted because they had already heard this false story of a false Christ. There is one true Christ. As Jesus tells his disciples plainly, you know the way. The Christ that is revealed in scripture. It says that they doubted. And when this happened, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus says that he holds all power, all authority in heaven and on earth. And it's by this that he makes this decree, that he pleads with us to live out this great commission because he holds all the power and all authority, that he is sovereign, that he is carrying out the Father's will each and every day. And because of this, because of his great power and authority, he tells us to live out this great commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is how powerful our Savior is, our Lord and King. He says, I hold all power and all authority and to carry out my father's will upon this earth I'm going to use you he's going to use me our savior is strong enough to carry out our father's will using the likes of us He puts his father's glory and majesty in full display by using us to carry out this great commission. How easy would it be for Jesus to come down here and just do whatever he needs to do? Instead, he chooses to use each and every single one of us. My greatest fear of the churches of God is not that we're strong. Or no, let me rephrase that. My greatest fear is that we think we are too strong, when in reality, we need to realize how weak we are. I am fully convinced of this, that God uses only the weak. He has no need for the strong, because the strong will think they can do it themselves, that they have no need of him. We have to realize who has all power and all authority and that we would not be here today if it was not for God drawing us into our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that we wouldn't be here if Christ did not choose us. One of the most ridiculous phrases I've ever heard that makes me cringe every time I hear it God chose me because I chose him. God did not choose me because I chose him. God chose me because he chose me. Because God decreed it. He drew me into Christ. And Christ did a mighty and wonderful work in me. And without that, I would never have come to God. I would never have come to Christ. I would never have chosen God on my own will, in my own power. It was only because of the grace of God that I stand here today, that any of us sit here today. God chose us because he chose us. Plain and simple. Turn over to 1 Corinthians.
1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 26. Paul writes, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We boast in our Lord and Savior, the one who holds all power and authority. He has chosen us, the weak, the foolish, the despised. I hope I don't offend anybody by saying that, but we are all weak, foolish, despised. And God uses you. God called you and chose you. Jesus commissioned you to carry out this great commission. To as it says, in verse, where to go? Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. And don't, I always say this, if you hear the word preach, I'm talking to you. To preach is to herald a message. Yeah, we give it to people who stand up here as a term preacher, but everybody in my eyes who is in the church of God, who has been given this great commission, is a preacher. We all have a message that we are called to herald, and that is Christ crucified. That we are to seek first that kingdom, and when we seek that kingdom, we realize that I can't just walk in, not as I am. I have to also seek his righteousness, God's righteousness that is found in Christ only. And Christ gave us his righteousness through his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Faith in him, we can be counted as righteous justified before God. And brothers and sisters, I know in that great commission, we are to teach all that he has commanded us. But it starts with faith and belief. That is where it all starts from. We love because he first loved us. Never lose sight of that. That is where our faith is founded. If your faith ever becomes grounded in the fact that I keep the Sabbath, that's why I'm saved, you're done for. Go back to your first love. Our Lord and Savior is powerful. He holds all power and all authority, and he shows it by using us, the weak and the foolish. And praise God for it. Jesus then goes on and says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. And that term, behold, my favorite translation of it says, look at me. Because there were some there who doubted. And let's all be honest for a second. We have all had our doubts. We have all had our moments where we've been anxious, 
where we've worried, where we've had fear, where we've doubted ourselves. But Jesus says, look at me. Turn over to John chapter 21. John chapter 21, and we'll pick up in verse 20, but this is after Jesus takes Peter and asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I do. He says, feed my sheep, tend to my sheep. And at the end of that, Jesus tells Peter in verse 19, follow me. And then Peter, being the awesome man he is, goes on in verse 20. It says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus tells us, no matter what is happening around us, what you see other people doing, what lives they are living, how good they have it, how bad they have it, Jesus says, look at me. Follow me. Look from where your redemption comes from. The best illustration I have for this there was a time where I was pretty young. I can't remember my exact age, probably seven or eight. And me and my brothers were across the street playing this really awesome game where we took two of us, threw us in the shed, locked it, and the two in the shed had to convince everybody else on the outside to let us out. <laughs> this is how we spent our days. And... It was me and one of my brothers, he shall remain nameless. He does have a biblical name, and he did slew Abel, but I won't tell you his name. We were locked in the shed, and as best as I remember it, I was standing at the door, just pounding on it, saying, let me out, let me out, because I figured that would be the best way to get out of there. Next thing I know, I get hit on top of the head with something. Turns out it was a metal stilt. Next thing I know, all I see is blood. (laughs) Touch my head, there's blood all over my hand. Found out, Cain actually, sorry. (laughs) The brother who shall remain nameless might have had a good strategy because I screamed, Bloody Mary. (laughs) And next thing I know, the door opened up. So in theory, we won. Now, I'm freaking out. All I see is blood on my hands. I feel the blood running down my head. And I run across the street to my house. And my dad's there to meet me. I'm screaming bloody murder. looking at my hands, and all he says is, don't look there. Don't look at the blood. So what do I do? I look at him. And it hurt. (laughs) But in that moment, there was a peace and a calm. And our Lord and Savior stands before us and says, look at me. But Christ I'm afraid. Look at me. I have my doubts. You can't use me. Look at me. I've failed. I've sinned again. Jesus says, look at me.
look at me, I am with you always. Even into the end of time. He's with you. Look at him. At the beginning of Matthew, we see Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. And here he simply, simply states, he is God the Word, still with us. Look at him. That is done by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. He is with us always. Look at him. No, have faith. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Do not have fear. Do not have doubt. Look at him and know that he is always with you. It's by that spirit, the spirit of Christ dwelling within us that we have this ability, this privilege to say that he is with us right here, right now. I want to look at that giving of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and we'll start at verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, when all were together in one place, and suddenly they, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we look at that. And we see that Spirit coming upon them as fire. And we always talk about the Holy Spirit as a fire. We tell ourselves always, do not quench the Spirit because we look at it as a fire. In Hebrews 12, verse 29, it says, Our God is a consuming fire. Now, all too often, we take that verse and we say, Heathens, pagans, watch out. Our God is a consuming fire. But let me ask you something. Is your God a consuming fire? If your God is a consuming fire, how could you ever not be burned by him? How could you not be consumed by him? So much as if a fire, fire is shut up in your bones that you cannot contain. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, and we'll start in verse 9. Jeremiah says, If I say, I will not mention his name or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whisperings, terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. Say, all my close friends watching for my fall, perhaps he will dece be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dreaded warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who test the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Brothers and sisters, 
if we could hope to live this life. To have it to where even the thought of not uttering a word of our glorious God and Savior. Befuddles us because we know that we are consumed by him. That the only thing we can do, the only thing we want to do, the only thing we will do is declare his word. To declare his truth. To declare the salvation we find in Christ and Christ alone. Brothers and sisters, I urge us all to look up from where our redemption comes from. Straighten up with confidence and look up from where your redemption comes from. Look up to your Lord and Savior and go. Look up from where he comes from and be consumed by the very Spirit of God. Look up to the one who holds all power and all authority and go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded us and behold, our Lord and Savior is with us always. Look at him. He is with us always, even until the end of the age. Amen.